Okay, so leaving Scientology. Yeah. It can feel like kind of stepping off a roller coaster. Right. That's been going like full speed for yep. who knows how long. Absolutely. You're probably feeling like a whirlwind of emotions. Yeah. And maybe even questioning reality a bit. That's so common. Really? Yeah. Like, is this real life? A lot of what people experience uh, in these yeah. high control groups like Scientology. Yeah really does have a lot of parallels uh -huh. in like well-established yeah. psychological principles. That's what we're doing today. Yeah. We're doing a deep dive awesome. into those parallels. I love it. We're going to unpack some of those core Scientology practices okay, and connect them to those broader psychological concepts Sweet. to help you understand like not just what happened, but why it felt yeah. so real at the time totally. and to guide us through this. We have an expert Hello. who can shed some light on these complex psychological dynamics. I'm happy to be here. At play. I'm excited to like decode yeah. these experiences. Exactly. It's like having a decoder ring yeah. for your own experience. Exactly. So let's start with something okay. that I think a lot of ex-Scientologists yeah. can relate to. Okay. Those intense training routines. Oh, yeah. Or TRs. Yeah. Remember TR0? Uh-huh. Where you had to maintain this unwavering gaze. Oh, yeah. And resist any reaction. Yes. No matter what. The infamous bull baiting. The other person did. What's fascinating here. Right. Is the potential link. Uh-huh. To the Gansfeld effect. The, the what? So you might be thinking, wait. Yeah. What does staring at someone right. have to do with sensory deprivation? It doesn't exactly scream sensory deprivation. All right. You know. But bear with me. Okay. By narrowing your focus Ugh. to just that one point of contact, yeah. you're essentially reducing external stimuli. Oh. And this can actually induce hmm. altered states of consciousness, almost like a light trance. Well, it's like accidentally stumbling into a psychological phenomenon yes. through a Scientology exercise. Precisely. Okay. And here's where it gets really interesting. Okay. While resisting the bull baiting. Yeah could actually build resilience okay. to certain manipulation techniques, huh. that constant confrontation, yeah. especially within a high pressure environment, right. like Scientology, yeah. could also be a form of conditioning. Oh, you see. it's like walking a tightrope. Yeah. Between building mental toughness mm -hmm. and being conditioned to accept a certain level of, so let's just call it what it is, yeah. psychological pressure. Exactly. Yeah. It really highlights yeah. how these environments can shape our responses. Speaking of subtle, let's talk about the emotional tone scale. This yeah. ranking of emotions yeah. from apathy to enthusiasm okay. is used constantly in Scientology. Yeah, you're all... You're encouraged to assess yourself uh -huh. and others based on the scale. Right. And so what's intriguing here okay. is this concept of projective identification. Projective identification. Yeah. So essentially by labeling uh -huh. someone's emotional state, yeah. you might actually be influencing them oh. to feel that way. So it's not just about observing emotions. Uh -huh. It's about potentially shaping them. Exactly. Right. Think about it. If okay. someone's constantly telling you yeah. that you're suppressive or that you're in a low tone, right? it can become like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like being handed a script yeah. for how you're supposed to feel. Totally. Right. And on the flip side, yeah. there's that constant pressure uh -huh. to project an uptone, yeah. even if it's not genuine, Yeah. which can lead to suppressing your true feelings. Yeah, so it creates this dissonance right. between your internal experience exactly. and the yeah. outward persona you're expected to maintain yeah. exactly. that one. Okay. Okay, moving on. Okay. Let's talk about those success stories. Oh, yeah. You know the ones you write after completing a course? Yes. Highlighting how amazing it was uh -huh. and how much it helped you. Right. This ties into right. a powerful psychological principle okay. called the reiteration effect. Reiteration effect. The more you're exposed to an idea, especially in a community yeah. where it's constantly being reinforced, yeah. the more likely you are to internalize it as truth. So even if your experience wasn't entirely positive, right. the act of writing a glowing success story uh -huh. and hearing others do the same yeah. could solidify the belief exactly. that Scientology really is the answer. It's like creating a feedback loop yeah. that amplifies certain beliefs uh -huh. regardless of the individual experience. Right. And while like positive testimonials can be genuine, yeah. this social pressure to conform right. adds another letter of complexity. Now let's shift gears a bit and talk about in Theta, uh -huh. 
So this is any information right. that's critical of Scientology. Yeah. Which members are often actively discouraged yes. from engaging with. This is where this concept of escalation of commitment comes in. Escalation of commitment. It's that very human tendency uh. to keep investing in something. Okay. Even when evidence suggests that it's not working. Yeah. Simply to justify yeah. the time, energy, yeah. or emotion you've already poured in. So by avoiding in theta, right. you might actually double down yeah. on your existing beliefs. Uh-huh. To avoid the discomfort of cognitive dissonance, cognitive dissonance, that mental tension of holding conflicting ideas. Yeah. So you're just like, no, no, no. Right. This is the truth. Exactly. And that avoidance uh -huh. can become a self-perpetuating cycle. Oh, wow. The more you shield yourself from critical information. Right. The harder it becomes to confront those potentially uncomfortable truths. OK, let's talk about something a little more concrete. Okay. Language. Uh huh. Scientology places a huge emphasis yes. on using its specific dictionary, right. the tech dictionary, Yay. to define terms. And what's interesting here yeah. is the connection yeah. to thought terminating cliches. Thought terminating cliches. These are phrases that are designed yeah. to shut down critical thinking. Yeah. So in Scientology, it's this idea yeah. that any misunderstanding you have right. is simply because you're not using the correct definition right. from the tech dictionary. It's like saying, don't question the concept. Exactly. Just accept our definition. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's this pervasive use mm -hmm. of loaded language, okay. words with strong emotional connotations yeah. that are meant to evoke a specific feelings right. and reinforce a particular worldview. So it's not just about defining terms. Right. It's about shaping your emotional response. It's about controlling the narrative. To those terms. Through language. Wow. Yeah. Speaking of controlling the narrative, okay. let's dive into the world of OT levels. Right. This is where things get a little more, huh. shall we say, supernatural. Right. And this ties into oh, yeah. the fundamental attribution error. Fundamental attribution error. Our tendency to attribute mm -hmm. someone's behavior right. to their internal traits yeah. while overlooking the influence that of the situation. So if someone claiming to be an OT yes. does something seemingly extraordinary, right. you might attribute it Le to wow. their OT status mm -hmm. rather than considering <laughs> other more rational yeah. explanations. It's like seeing the world. Wow. Through a very specific lens. Yeah. Where any unusual event uh -huh. is interpreted through the framework right. of Scientology beliefs. The powerful example. Yeah. Of how our existing beliefs can shape our perception totally. of reality. Totally. Absolutely. No, we can't talk about Scientology right. without mentioning yeah. L. Ron Hubbard or LRH. Of course. As he's often called. Yes. His lectures are central. Mm hmm to the belief system. This brings us to okay. the concept of identity transference. Identity transference. The unconscious adoption uh -huh. of traits or beliefs right. from an admired figure, Yeah. often a charismatic leader. So by repeatedly listening right. to LRH lectures, mm -hmm. especially given his revered status, yeah. Could you start to internalize his ideas? You could. And integrate them yeah. into your own identity. Absolutely. Yeah. When you immerse yourself yeah. in someone's teachings, uh -huh. particularly in a group that reinforces those teachings, right. it can create a powerful sense of alignment, right. almost like merging your identity. It's almost like becoming a disciple. Right. In a sense. It highlights the profound influence yeah. authority figures can have. Right. Especially within a structured belief system, yeah, like Scientology. Exactly, so easy to see right. how those dynamics can take hold. Yeah, when you're immersed in that kind of environment. Totally. Yeah, it's easy to see how those dynamics can take hold. You know, when you're immersed in that kind of environment. Oh yeah. All right, let's move on to something else very central to Scientology. Okay. Policies. You know, there's right. a policy for just about everything, and. You know, if a disagreement arises, yeah. you're told to look up the relevant policy <laughs> to find the correct solution. Because LRH had an answer for everything. Right. At least according to Scientology. Right. Exactly. And this ties into the famous Milgram experiment. Okay, wait. So you're saying there's a connection yeah. between following Scientology policies yeah. 
and those people shocking others in that experiment. Yeah, it's about the psychological mechanism of obedience to authority. Right. In both cases, you have a perceived authority. Right. The experimenter in Milgram's study yeah. and LRH's policies in Scientology. Right. And you're encouraged to shift responsibility okay. onto that authority. Wow. And it can lead you to do things you wouldn't normally consider yeah. simply because you're following orders. It's like that classic line, I was just following orders. Right. It's chilling how easily we can abdicate yeah. our own sense of responsibility yeah. when we perceive someone else exactly. as being in control. That abdication of responsibility wow. is often a key factor in these high control groups. Okay, let's talk about events. Okay. Scientology has a ton of mandatory events, right. often requiring travel uh -huh. and significant financial contributions. This is where effort justification comes into play. Effort justification. Yeah. The more we invest in something, mm. time, money, emotion, okay. the more likely we are right. to convince ourselves it's valuable. Yeah. Even if there's evidence to the contrary. So all those hours, yeah. all those dollars, all that emotional energy right. you poured into those events exactly. could lead you to justify your commitment uh -huh. to Scientology, even if you had doubts creeping in. It's a way to avoid the mental discomfort right. of cognitive dissonance. Right. Our minds don't like holding conflicting ideas. Yeah. So we often find ways yeah. to rationalize our actions and beliefs. Mm -hmm even if it means twisting the facts a bit. Okay, now let's address something oh, okay. that I know is a sensitive topic for a lot of people. Yeah. Donations. Mm -hmm. Scientology is notorious right. for its emphasis on financial contributions. Yeah. And there have been many accusations oh, yeah. of undue influence. This is where we can look at the sunk cost fallacy. Sunk cost fallacy. The more you invest in something, right. the harder it becomes to walk away, uh -huh. even if you have serious concerns. Yeah. Stopping would mean acknowledging a loss. Right. And our brains are wired to avoid loss yeah. whenever possible. It's like throwing good money after bad yeah. just to maintain the illusion that yeah. your initial investment was worthwhile. And to add another layer to this, okay. there's also choice supportive bias. Choice supportive bias. This is our tendency to view our past choices yeah. in a more positive light. Uh -huh. Even if those choices yeah. weren't necessarily the best ones. Right. So you might rationalize your donations. Yeah emphasizing the good you believe you were doing uh -huh. and downplaying any doubts you might have had. Okay, let's talk about a couple of phrases okay. that are practically mantras in Scientology. All right. Acceptable truth uh -huh. and the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. So acceptable truth is essentially a form yeah. of lying by omission. Okay. It's about leaving out crucial details right. to present a carefully curated version of reality. Yeah. Huh one that serves the interests of the group. So it's not outright lying. Right. But it's definitely a form of manipulation. Exactly. And then you have the greatest good principle. Yeah. Which sounds noble on the surface. Right. But can be used to justify yeah. some very questionable actions. Okay. One example that comes to mind okay. is the practice of vexatious litigation. Vexatious litigation. Which is essentially using lawsuits without merit. Wow. To harass or silence critics. So it's like weaponizing the legal system. Exactly. To protect the image of the group. Right. Even if it means bending the rules. And that ties back to acceptable truth. Right. It's all about maintaining a carefully constructed facade. Uh-huh. Even if it means compromising ethical principles. It's a powerful reminder. It is. That lofty sounding phrases. Yeah. Can be used to mask. Yes. Less than admirable motives. Absolutely. Now let's shift to a practice okay. that's particularly controversial. All right. The RPF, uh -huh. the Rehabilitation Project Force. This is where members who are deemed to be right. in a lower condition yeah. are sent to do intense labor mm -hmm. and follow strict regimens right. to supposedly rehabilitate themselves. Yeah, the RPF right. has been the subject of a lot of criticism. And for good reason. And for good reason. Yeah. One way to understand the psychological dynamics at play here okay. is through the concept of learned helplessness. Learned helplessness. This is a state that can develop right. when someone experiences repeated negative events uh -huh. and begins to believe oh, they have no control over their situation. So the strict control... The lack of autonomy, right? The repetitive tasks, yes, 
All of that could contribute to a feeling of helplessness. Exactly. Even if someone might objectively have options to lead. It's like being stuck in a maze. Wow. Where every path seems to lead to a dead end. Oh, gosh. And it's important to draw a parallel here okay. to the Stanford prison experiment. Okay. That study showed how quickly seemingly normal people uh -huh. can engage in abusive behavior right. when placed in a position of power. Wow. And conversely, individuals subjected to yeah. strict control and dehumanizing treatment right. can become passive and compliant, yeah. even when opportunities for resistance exist. Like a chilling reminder it is. of how much our behavior is influenced by our environment right. and the roles we're assigned. Absolutely, and it underscores the importance of recognizing these dynamics, yeah. especially for anyone right. who's been through a similar experience. You know, as we've been talking, I've been struck uh -huh. by how many of these Scientology practices yeah. seem designed to tap into our very human need right. for connection, purpose, and meaning. That's a key insight. Yeah. High demand groups often exploit right. these fundamental human needs, right. offering a seemingly perfect solution yeah. to life's challenges. Right. You know, they promise a path to happiness, enlightenment, or even salvation. Right. But the price of admission yeah. is often your freedom, your critical thinking. Right. And connection to the outside world. It's like being offered a beautiful, intricate cage. Exactly. You know, you might feel safe and secure inside. Right. But you're still trapped. But you're still trapped. Yeah. And breaking free from that cage right. can be a long and difficult process. Yeah. But it is possible. Yeah. The first step is understanding the nature of the cage itself. Right. Recognizing the psychological mechanisms that yeah. have kept you bound. And that's what we're hoping to do. Exactly. With this deep dive. Yeah. To give our listeners the tools. Yes. To deconstruct their experiences. Yeah. And reclaim their autonomy. It's about empowering people. Yeah. To see their own stories with fresh eyes. Right. To understand the forces uh -huh. that have shaped their perceptions and choices. It truly is, and that world often values those very things, you know, that Scientology seeks to control. Right. Independent thought, genuine connection, mm -hmm. and the freedom to define your own path. You know, as we've been talking about all these different aspects of Scientology, yeah. one thing that keeps coming back to me is yeah. the sheer intensity of it all. That's a great observation. Yeah. High demand groups often thrive right. on that sense of urgency. Yeah. You know, that heightened emotional atmosphere. Uh -huh. It serves several purposes, you know. Okay. It can make the teachings feel more profound. Right. It can discourage critical thinking. Yeah. Because there's this sense that you need to act now. Yeah. And it creates a powerful bond within the group mm -hmm. like everyone's in this heightened state together it's like everyone's running on adrenaline all the time exactly fueled by this shared belief system uh, and the constant pressure to prove your dedication and that intensity can make it even harder to leave oh you might start to question things internally yeah but the thought of losing that community right that sense of purpose that adrenaline rush right it can be terrifying it's almost like an addiction Right. It is a powerful analogy. Even if you know it's not healthy in the long run. Right. There's that pull to stay in that heightened state. And it explains why leaving a group like Scientology yeah. often involves this period of readjustment. Right. Your nervous system is used to operating yeah. at that high level of intensity. Right. So coming down can feel like a crash landing. So for our listeners who are feeling that crash, yeah. that sense of emptiness or disorientation, mm -hmm. what advice would you give them? Well, first and foremost, be patient with yourself. Okay. It takes time for your body and mind to recalibrate. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no set timeline for healing. Right. And it's okay to feel a range of emotions. Yeah. As you process what you've been through. Okay. Second, focus on self-care. You know, simple things like getting enough sleep, mm -hmm. eating nutritious foods, exercising. Right. These things can make a world of difference. Yeah. It's about reconnecting with your body. Right. And giving it what it needs to heal. It's like hitting the reset button. Exactly. On your nervous system. And as you do that, yeah. you might find that you can experience joy, uh huh, connection and purpose yeah. in ways you never imagined possible right. within the confines of Scientology. Yeah. Those things exist outside of that system uh -huh. and they're available to you now. And I think it's important to acknowledge yeah. that many people 
were drawn to Scientology. Right. With genuinely good intentions. Of course. You know, they were seeking answers. Yeah. Meaning a way to make a positive impact on uh, the world. Absolutely. It's not that those desires were wrong. Right. It's that the system they found themselves in yeah. was not designed to truly fulfill those needs. You're absolutely right. High demand groups often exploit our idealism, right. our desire to help others, mm -hmm. our longing for a better world. Right. They present a compelling vision, right. a seemingly perfect solution, yeah. but the reality rarely lives up to the promise. So as our listeners continue to process their experiences mm -hmm. and rebuild their lives, yeah. what final thought would you leave them with? Mm. What message of hope or encouragement? I would say this. Okay. Your journey out of Scientology is not an ending. It's mm -hmm. a beginning. Wow. It's the start of reclaiming your autonomy, Rough. your critical thinking skills, uh -huh. your own unique path. Yeah. It's a chance to reconnect with the world on your own terms. Right. To rediscover your passions. Mm -hmm. To build a life that is authentically yours. Yeah. It might not be easy. Yeah. But it will be worth it. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. For this deep dive. My pleasure. It's been an incredibly insightful and I think really important conversation. I agree. To our listeners, mm -hmm. remember, yeah. you are strong, you are resilient. Yes. And you are not alone. Absolutely. There's a whole world out there waiting to be explored. It is. And you have the power to create a beautiful life. You do. Filled with meaning, connection, and joy. Here's to new beginnings.